All right. In the interest of time, let me kick us off and I'll make some introductory comments and um, then I'll, I'll turn it over to our friends from the Center for Neighborhood Technology who uh, will walk us through today's topic about model ordinances for uh, trees, native landscapes, and green infrastructure. So I am Tom Jacobs with the Mid-America Regional Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you today. Today's, uh, today's workshop or webinar is part of uh, an effort led by Mark and many community partners on, on our green infrastructure work. As you may recall, we spent uh, three years developing a regional green infrastructure framework that was adopted by the Mark Board of Directors last year. And as part of that work, we developed a set of policy priorities, and uh, you can find all of that on our website. But chief among those was to uh, review and refine regional uh, policies relative to well, a whole suite of green infrastructure issues, uh, protecting trees and urban forestry and native landscaping and green infrastructure more generally were issues that emerged as very high priorities from the, I'd say 400 or so stakeholders that participated in our, our green infrastructure framework planning process. And so today's uh, the webinar is part of our work to move the, uh, move the ball downfield on that set of issues. We were fortunate enough to receive funding from EPA to support this work. And with those resources, we hired a, a team led by Gould Evans Associates, uh, led by Robert Whitman and Chris Brewster. And that team includes a Center for Neighborhood Technology out of Chicago. And I've, uh, I've, I've interacted just sporadically with CNT over the years, and I've just been just staggeringly impressed at the quality of their work and their national leadership on so many different issues. Some years ago, Scott Bernstein joined us here in Kansas City um, as, as part of our sustainable uh, communities leadership uh, development work. And today we're so thrilled to have Drew Williams Clark and Anna Wolfs uh, support us for this webinar. They've, they've really provided national leadership on, on water management issues and other issues on transportation and energy and kind of capacity building wrapped around resilience and sustainability. So, uh, quick introductions for the two of them before I, I turn this over to them. Drew is the Managing Director for Urban Resilience at the Center for Neighborhood Technologies. He focuses on water resilience as a tool for climate equity. You can find a more detailed uh, bio for each of them on, on, on their website, certainly. Anna manages CNT's research and municipal outreach, uh, Great Lakes Water Infrastructure Project, and she facilitates the organization's work on water infrastructure and finance. So the two of them are, uh, they, they have a lot to share with us about model ordinances and that will inform our work as we try to put together um, some model ordinances that uh, our local communities might consider for adoption to help support regional green infrastructure uh, uh, policy and implementation. Uh, I might add that we, we after we uh, contracted with Gould Evans, they, they conducted a focus group with I'd say 12 or so area thought leaders on this topic. This is the next step in our process in which um, we wanted to hear from a national thought leader and, and, and hear comments from those of you who are able to participate today. After this time, what Gould Evans is going to do is based on their research and uh, interviews with local municipalities and, and the focus group and, and input from CNT, they'll go ahead and draft something up uh, we'll share it with a focus group for further refinement, and uh, and then we'll go ahead and publish it and share it with the community, I believe, in about two months or so. So at that time, what we'd hope is that um, we, I hope we have a product that folks can use, and it should be a flexible product that folks can consider for adoption in ways that really are, are not too prescriptive, but uh, allow to meet the flexible conditions of, you know, each of your 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 communities. So um, by way of agenda for today, uh, Drew and Anna will spend somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour on their presentation, and then we'll have a full 30 minutes or so for discussion on the back end. If you have any questions, I'd ask that you use the chat function on the webinar, and I'll track that, and um, during the discussion, I'll kind of, uh, I'll moderate that discussion using uh, your, your comments and discussion chat. 
So with that, it's my absolute pleasure to turn this over to Drew and Anna to walk us through uh, their thoughts on green infrastructure model ordinances. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and it's really exciting to watch the participant count just shoot up. Um, we're all sort of mired in a sea of Zooms lately and I know that they have, they create fatigue uh, and we'll try to keep things light and, um, you know, at a good enough pace that people um, are captivated by what we have to say. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I'll just add a little bit about myself and then maybe Anna can do that when she uh, starts her slides. Um, I worked for the Regional uh, Planning Commission in Chicago, CMAP, for about 10 years. And so I have great fondness for, for regional planning work. Um, I was also a municipal planner for a couple of years at a um, inner ring suburb uh, in the Chicagoland area and had to draft and adopt and do all the outreach around ordinance adoption. And so I see both sides of what folks on this call are going through and I hope that we can provide sort of a balance of, of, of what a regional can provide um, as well as sort of make sure that we drill into some of the on the ground things that many of the municipalities to be facing. So uh, with that, uh, and I think you're driving, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, cool, so I just want to sort of set the table a little bit and talk uh, about overall the project objectives. Um, so in, essentially, and I'm, I'm just sort of going to read this because I think it's important to, to center us. The idea here is to develop a model ordinance for the Kansas City region related to urban forestry, tree protection, native landscaping, and weeds and invasive species. So a tall order, um, lots of really meaty stuff in there and lots of very timely stuff. Um, but this is also related to and sort of descending from Mark's green infrastructure policy framework that Tom just talked about. And so we're going to try to keep this presentation to some degree focused on the immediate near term goals of the um, forestry tree landscaping ordinances that are going to be part of the model ordinance work uh, that Gould Evans will do in partnership with us. But we also want to broaden this a little bit and make sure that we're tying things back to some of the um, benefits of green infrastructure and, and what we can do with green infrastructure overall through regulations. So and if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so we have a couple of polls. Uh, we understand that it's very difficult to have a, a real rich dialogue with 58 participants so far. And so we are going to ask uh, you a few questions and we hope that polling um, will be a way that we can make this as interactive as possible. Uh, and I want to warn everyone that we're all learning Zoom. It's a steep learning curve for us all. Uh, and so we're pretty confident that this is going to go off without a hitch, but hopefully everyone can be uh, kind if, if things take a minute to, to, to iron out the kinks. So if we could go ahead and, and launch that poll, amazing. Um, which of the following sectors do you work in? Community-based nonprofits, elected official, municipal staff, MPO staff, private consultant, regional slash national nonprofit, or other? And we'll give you maybe to the count of five to get in your choices. This isn't all that deep. We don't have to think about this too much. Uh, we just want to see who's out there and, and make sure that we're targeting our remarks to the people that are here. So great. I think we can end that now. It looks like, you know, sort of a slim plurality is municipal staff, followed by consultants uh, and other nonprofits. So that's really helpful to understand. Um, that's great. So I think we can go on to the next slide now, which is just sort of an overview of our agenda. Um, we want to talk first about the benefits of trees, native landscaping, and green infrastructure. I think those are narrowly conceived and we want to broaden your perspective on that a little bit. Uh, we want to socialize sort of land focus options, you know, all of these model ordinances that we're looking at right now and the many regulations that govern the topics that we're talking about tend to fall into two categories, whether they focus on public land or private land. And then we're gonna go into some different options based on those two categories. So under public land, we'll talk a little bit about um, federal transportation project review, which is part of what an MPO does, the capital improvement planning, uh, and we're sort of slipping that in there to get you to think a little bit differently maybe. Um, and then their tree ordinances really can be on private or public land and sometimes both depending on how they're written. And then for private land regulation, we'll talk about stormwater management ordinances, low impact development ordinances, native planning ordinances, invasive plants ordinances, and then a cost sharing uh, 
program ordinance that we've helped to pilot in a few different municipalities. Then we'll talk a little bit about Mark's role and then we'll end with some discussion. Um, like Tom said, we wanna make sure that there's plenty of time left over. So please continue to put any questions that you might have in the chat and uh, Tom is gonna sort of curate those and we'll have a bit of a panel back and forth in the end. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. And then Anna, I'll let you take over. Great, thanks Drew. Um, so just a, a, a short background on myself, just I think because it dovetails nicely into this next section. I, my background is, um, you know, I have an urban planning degree, but most of my work over the past four or five years has been on urban stormwater management, water supply management. Um, so thinking a lot about how green infrastructure specifically intersects with stormwater management um, improvements in urban areas specifically. Um, but a lot of the work that CNT does, of course, is to think about an issue from a broad range of perspectives and make sure that we're talking about whatever kind of policy solution or, you know, implementation solution we're talking about resonates with people that might have different priorities. And so one of the things that CNT has done research on in the past and has recently sort of um, dived back into is this conversation around community benefits of nature-based solutions or what we call green infrastructure and native plants, trees fit within that, that umbrella. Um, so this, this table, this matrix shows a series of, or a, a long list of sort of community priorities or benefits that communities might receive from specific green infrastructure interventions. Um, so we have it bucketed into health benefits, economic benefits, uh, the sort of standard climate adaptation mitigation benefits, and then we end with transportation. What we're trying to show with this slide is that really you can implement any of these key stormwater or green infrastructure techniques, which we're calling green stormwater infrastructure because from CNT's perspective, that's sometimes how we start the conversation, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about the improved outdoor air quality, uh, reduced noise pollution, which has significant um, health improvements tied to it, improved economic benefits and outcomes, um, and then improved transportation um, outcomes. And what we'd like to do throughout this conversation is think about green infrastructure within that broad umbrella of community benefits, making sure that we're talking about the, um, whatever the primary benefit might be for the specific community that's looking to implement a green infrastructure strategy um, and think about you know, that primary benefit and then the secondary tertiary benefits that come alongside. And that can help bring more people on board to support the, the effort. It can help introduce new payers into the conversation um, it can be a really good way to sort of broaden the range of, of outcomes that you get. Um, let's see. So we just wanted to include a couple of photos of sort of really well done green infrastructure um, technologies, we're calling them. On the left, you see a really nice sort of expanded tree pit. Um, so you have a few trees that are nicely manicured. Um, and it, it increases walkability, it, it benefits stormwater management practices, it, uh, produces uh, some shade, possibly produces some energy savings for the area if you have enough trees in the area. Um, and it looks really nice, so it increases that aesthetic benefit of, of you know, what a commercial strip might look like with, with more trees or without trees. Um, and then on the right, we have a high performance rain garden in Pittsburgh. Um, and Pittsburgh, you know, their primary priority as a community is stormwater management. They're very flashy, they've got lots of hills. So they have big problems with stormwater management, but this rain garden is, is also built to improve pollinator habitat. It's built to improve the, the land value in this commercial district. So it has a lot of those co-benefits that the, the city is benefiting from, um, in addition to improving their stormwater management on site. Uh, back to you, Drew. Thanks, Anna. Do you wanna go ahead and advance the slide? Awesome. So part of the, the way that we want to think about this is sort of this dynamic between ordinances that focus on public land and ordinances that focus on private land. And so, you know, when we think about things that focus on public land, um, they can come in a variety of ways. And we'll talk about those more deeply uh, as we go through the rest of the presentation. But I just want to think about you know, and dive into what might be some of the opportunities and weaknesses of doing work that would encourage native plantings or uh, mature trees that have a lot of benefits. Um, Anna just talked about 
um, on public land, right? So opportunities, we, oftentimes we think about scale um, and it, it can be about availability and it can also be ab about assembly, right? So if you think about um, the opportunities on public land, you may be talking about land that's larger in nature because of the kinds of things that are on that land and also um, that it tends to be uh, it not require a ton of land assembly, which kind of gets into the next piece, which is called networking. Um, we're working on another project right now that looks at the um, benefits of different kinds of, of natural solutions um, when they're not just isolated on one piece of land, but might be networked by linear land. So when you think about some of these abstract words that I'm using, right, um, you know, networking tends to be possible when there's linear land on the public right of way, right? So we're thinking about parkways, um, you know, along residential streets. Uh, we might be thinking about um, naturally preserved lands along streams. Um, there are a lot of different ways that um, land that, that can provide the potential for networking different natural solutions. So in other words, um, there's this theory running that a lot of people want to test that says that you can get a lot more benefit out of multiple natural solutions if they're networked and connected by other natural solutions. So we think about scale, maybe more land available on public property. We think about networking, there's a lot of linear public property, mostly when we think about transportation rights of way typically. Uh, and then sustainability, and the sustainability there is really code for, you know, there's a sustainable revenue source associated with um, public, you know, local governments. And so, you know, we may be all be questioning that right now, and we have nothing but empathy for um, the sort of revenue, um, you know, sort of volatility right now that everyone must be coping with or trying to cope with. But in general, and over long periods of time, typically we find that, you know, if there's one public owner that obviously has tax revenue to depend on, then compared to private land that tends to change owners over time, um, you know, there tends to be more of a sustainability factor on public land. So there are weaknesses, obviously, and many of you right now are thinking, but, 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 totally understand that. Some of the weaknesses are, it is another capital liability, right? So in general, what we find nationwide is that local governments don't tend to be wanting more capital liability. Um, but anytime you build a new piece of infrastructure, whether it's green or gray, it comes with operations and maintenance costs for as long as the local government is owning and maintaining that, you know, asset. And then there are unknowns. What are those O&M costs? And, and we recognize that gray infrastructure O&M costs have been long understood, are, you know, pretty much set in stone, pun intended at this point, <clears throat> and that O&M costs associated with natural solutions are evolving in some ways. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we kind of also then need to think about how would you align sort of asset management processes on natural solutions uh, and make them sort of similar to the way that you do asset management for gray infrastructure. And, you know, those are things that are still evolving and people are learning right now. Um, and then the, the last thing, and I think that we've heard this, you know, from the previous focus groups, and especially when it comes down to native plantings and some pieces of green infrastructure that people just don't recognize. They're not part of their sort of um, visual vocabulary, so to speak, of when they're walking around a typical urban environment. Um, and people start to say, like, why isn't the city mowing its lawns, right? So if you see tall grass, which we know has benefits, right? It has longer root systems, it, you know, absorbs more rains, it has better infiltration potential. Um, it does all of the things that Anna described better than turf grass, which is, you know, some would even say an invasive species with a lowercase i. So you know, we, we need to think about those sorts of things and, and, and perceptions don't change easily. Uh, and so those are clearly weaknesses. So we can go to the next slide. So then if we think about you know, what are the, the opportunities and weaknesses for um, native landscaping, green infrastructure, trees on private land, you know, I think the first opportunity that most people think of is costs. It shifts the costs from the local government to the private landowner. Um, and it, you know, there's another way to frame this is just it's sharing of cost, right? You know, so, you know, benefits may be unequally derived uh, if, if, you know, native, sorry, natural solutions are on private property and the owner of that property, since they derive more benefit, maybe should have more uh, of the, the cost burden associated with that. Um, 
Second thing is long-term land availability. In general, if you look at the aggregate of land in any one place, it tends to be about two thirds is private and about a third is public. Um, and so I know that that sort of causes a bit of a nuanced tension from the previous slide, but um, in reality, you know, a lot of what we talk about uh, at CNT is that if we're going to pursue natural solutions that have these different kinds of community benefits, we can't only focus on public property. It's probably not the best way to deal with that. Uh, and so we tend to talk about distributed solutions that involve both public and private. But in general, there is more land available in, on the private ownership side in any one geography as opposed to the public, um, with some exceptions, obviously. And then, you know, we just talked about distributed solutions. And, and, and oftentimes, if you're looking for a particular community benefit, whether it's, you know, respiratory health improvement or, you know, stormwater management, the optimal solution may not be to have one giant thing on one piece of property. It might be to have a lot of little solutions distributed over public and private property. Uh, and so it really depends on what the benefit is you're seeking and what's the optimal way to configure whatever natural solution you're trying to implement. Um, and then weaknesses. So, you know, performance can be difficult uh, to monitor uh, in, in a private land situation, right? So what I'm trying to say essentially is it's unclear over time if you can't be, you know, doing sort of sampling or other kinds of sensory monitoring on private property, how much effect that natural solution is having on that private property because someone needs to gain access to that property or the private landowner has to be deeply committed to, to that monitoring work. And it is work. Um, the other thing is sort of the, the maintenance that's implied in that, which is to say, typically on public property, people are used to maintaining um, to a certain standard, whatever asset it is, whether it's roads or it's pipes or whatever piece of public infrastructure is being maintained, um, you know, the public sector at least tends to have an idea of what the the sort of level of services they're trying to achieve and what the cost is to deliver that level of service over time um, and is willing to sort of at least deal with the costs in the long run, whether or not they're fully funded in a way that causes sort of a long-term performance to, to have a, a level of standardization or a sort of a predictability. And that's not the same on private property, right? And in, in real terms, what we're talking about is, you know, one, one landowner uh, at, at a home might be really good at maintaining a rain garden, for example, but when ownership changes and somebody else finds a pit with a bunch of tall grass, they might mow right over it. And so it's difficult to sort of have consistency when ownership changes. Uh, and that sort of leads to that last turnover point. So those are sort of some of the dynamics that we want to make everybody aware of before we start talking about specific ordinances about the differences between public and private land focused ordinances. And so now we'd love to do uh, the next poll, which is to say, which types of ordinances, model ordinances would be most helpful to your community? And the options are those that focus on public land, those that focus on private land, and both are equally helpful. And we will make sure to show you the results of this poll this time. I promise I wasn't pulling the wool over your eyes with my own little description last time. Um, we just uh, are learning this technology like many of you. So maybe I'll just give another five seconds for everybody to think about it. It looks like we've got most people. So I think we can go ahead and end it now and then share those results. Um, so what we found is that most people think that both are equally helpful, and that's great. Um, but maybe the second is on public land with the, f the following a sort of a strict focus on private land. So that's helpful to know that people are willing and interested in pursuing different kinds of options. That's great. So if we could go to the next slide, and I think this one might be... Okay, so then what we want to do with some of these polls, we're going to do another poll. We're going to do three in a row. Um, we're going to ask you now, which types of these ordinances do you think would have the greatest benefit to your community? Again, those that focus on public land, those that focus on private land, and both are equally helpful are the options. And the, the nuance here is that we want, we understand like what you might think are most helpful. Um, and that might be governed in part by things like political feasibility or cost or things like that, totally understand. But this is sort of saying in a no cost world where money grows on trees, which do you think would have the most benefits? We're at 60%, so we'll end the polling. Okay, yeah, we can go ahead and end that, great.
So then we can share those results. And again, a pretty similar distribution. Not, not many were picked off um, from that exercise. So then the last of the three polls will go next. If we can stop sharing those, which is which types of model ordinances come with, at, with the highest costs to a local government. And we fully understand that that means the highest cost to your taxpayers. This is not a political spin on that particular question. Just had to figure out one way to phrase it. And I like Anna's bar of 60%, so maybe we should just stop here and we can share. Okay, so it seems pretty, pretty 70% of you think that the focus on public land is probably the highest cost for the local government, which I would say in general probably makes sense on the face of it. Um, just encourage everyone to think about, you know, the same sort of cost benefit analysis you would do on any infrastructure or capital planning um, when you're thinking about those in terms of return on investment. So I think we can, oops, I think we have to share those just to make sure that people understand that we're doing that. And then now that everyone believes what I said, we can stop. And I will, Sorry. that's okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the options for public land ordinance types. And the first one is one that we've only seen in one case, but I think it's a really interesting thing. And since some of the people that are on this call work for the MPO, um, this is in, you know, I think again, this ordinance is loosely defined here. And especially in, on public land, um, there may or may not actually be an ordinance that would be the device here, but we're using that sort of as a way to talk about these different options. So, um, you know, I think that many people don't conceive of one funding stream that can fund natural solutions to a variety of problems um, is looking using transportation funds, which are absolutely valid. And in this case, very specifically, every federally funded transportation project has to have a drainage plan. Um, and there's no reason that those drainage plans can't use green infrastructure to meet the uh, performance measures that are established. So, uh, and at least one case in the Northeast, sorry, Northwest Indiana Plan Commission, which is the MPO for sort of the Gary, Indiana area, um, they, when they do their uh, project screens, project applications, um, in their drainage plans, they actually say, um, you need to either have a natural component to your drainage plan or provide evidence or a narrative justification as to why the, your drainage uh, performance measures can't be met through natural solutions. And so it's a way of putting it back on the local government to say, well, the only way we can do this is gray and this is why. And it could be a cost factor. That's a perfectly reasonable um, uh, sort of way to sort of get around that. So this is sort of an example of what I'm talking about. I said it more nar in a more narrative fashion than actually reading through these bullets. Um, but this is an, a, a way to allow transportation funds to be able to, to do some amount of natural solution um, implementation on public private property. So if we can go to the next uh, slide. This is one that we talk about a lot. Uh, and I think that it's, this is a very CNT way of talking about things. So I'll be honest, um, it, was, it is sort of, I think to many people, a very different way of conceiving of how we deal with um, natural community assets and green infrastructure. Um, and so it is cheating. Again, this is not particularly an ordinance per se. But imagine if we treated natural solutions like public assets, if we treated every tree like an asset that we derived some kind of a benefit from um, and had some performance measure for that benefit, um, how would we approach the, the development and the operations and the maintenance of those assets? Because right now we don't tend to treat them that way. Um, and the same can be said for, for other kinds of green infrastructure and for native plantings on public property. Um, they have a benefit, those benefits can be measured, um, and those benefits have some kind of a monetary value. So we should be able to do asset management strategies and capital improvement planning the same way. Um, and if we think about the way that we approach capital improvement planning for roads, for example, you know, we, we think about the way that that sort of cycle tends to work. You would identify some sort of a problem. So there's some sort of a bottleneck, for example, in one area, you know, you would commission a study to identify alternatives to solve that problem, be it engineering or sort of, you know, management options. 
Um, and then you would sort of look at the cost benefit of each of those alternatives. So if green alternatives were included, if, for example, in a stormwater management context or another kind of community benefit, then you would have to do the same kind of studies and you'd have to evaluate the cost, the ongoing maintenance costs, um, the engineering complexity, the feasibility of using a natural solution as a public asset. Um, and you would use the same accounting techniques that you would use in any kind of infrastructure development process. And you would include these natural solutions in your five-year capital improvement plans if you're doing those already. Um, and in that way, you know, you would be approaching these solutions in the exact same way and ideally setting aside the same operations and maintenance funds that you would for any for managing any other um, public asset uh, and so this is something that we're really trying to get people to think hard about uh, in part because the longer that we hear these arguments that o m is hard to understand and you know maintenance is something we can't quite figure out well the way we got over that um, with all kinds of gray infrastructure is by studying it over and over and over again uh, and that's because lots and lots of different folks were studying it and if no one is studying it in the same robust way that they study and plan for gray infrastructure we'll never get there um, so that's just another way to think about that uh, and then the third, uh, so this is where we get sort of straddling the line. And this is when we get to really the core component of the, of the project that we're working on now. So there are a few different types of tree ordinances. And I want to talk about each of them a little bit. But this can be either a, a tree ordinance can cover, govern either public and or private land. And so let's talk about all these sort of broad types. And the way that I found these types sort of broad categories, because there's a lot of nuance in here. And we all know that Different tree ordinances can include multiple of these components. Uh, they can, you know, live in different parts of your municipal codes. And so broadly speaking, uh, according to the International Society of Arbor Culture, there are sort of these three broad types of, of tree ordinances. One is a street tree ordinance, and that's the one I'm personally um, most familiar with, um, you know, where you sort of do a tree census on, on trees that are in the public right of way. Um, you use a formula to evaluate those trees based on a number of factors. Um, and then anytime the public right of way has to be vacated um, in a special development process of some kind, uh, the private developer asking for that public right of way to be vacated would have to pay the real value of that tree. Ideally, then those funds go into a tree planting a new tree that would have the same value. The, the sort of downside to that is that oftentimes we take the less cost outcome, which is to plant a new tree. So if, for example, if you're, um, if a developer wants to remove a mature tree, a mature tree has a lot of benefits and the degrees of magnitude of a mature tree's benefit are far and away higher than a young tree or a sapling. And so what tends to happen is a mature tree is removed and a sapling is planted. And the problem with that is it's cost effective. There's some new revenues there, ideally for you know, forestry um, you know, ongoing costs, but it doesn't necessarily replace the benefit, the true benefit of a mature tree. So these, that's sort of like one of the downsides of a, of a street tree ordinance. Um, but there are lots of benefits and when done well, they're, they're great ordinances. Um, another is a tree protection ordinance, um, which is looking more at private development. And typically when, um, you know, there would be a significant rehab of an existing structure or a brand new structure after a demolition or a brand new structure on a greenfield, you would have as part of your permit review, a landscape plan. And in that landscape plan, you would have to identify, you know, which trees are being removed, depending on the tree and its type and its value. Um, you know, that tree, again, might have to be either replanted, or there might be a fee in lieu of replanting that tree that would allow that developer to, to remove it. So this is a Again, it could be public, it could be private, but typically these tend to focus on private, or at least that's their sort of benefit as opposed to a street tree ordinance. And then a view ordinance is probably not what we're talking about today, but I'm throwing it out there in case I'm wrong. And this really has to do with making sure that um, that there that conflicts between property owners are resolved when a tree blocks a view and then that's for a safety reason light if a tree is sort of at a particular place in an intersection where it would make it difficult for an like a driver to make a right turn for example you know what's what happens in that situation or uh when it blocks the view of a of a you know, building owner nearby because of its size etc and so just trying to make sure um sort of that character is preserved on on, on the private property 
So those are three different types of street ordinances. All of them have their benefits. All of them have their weaknesses, um, but wanted to sort of throw out those three types. And so we want to do a little poll now, and then I think I'm going to stop talking, um, which is the first one here is which type of tree ordinance would be most helpful for your community? And the options are, I think maybe we have the wrong poll here this time, um, but maybe, just take one second here. Um, so I think maybe we skipped this poll um, because I know that we're... Okay. Well, that's okay. You know, I think uh, it, it would be helpful if people, just for now, maybe the easiest way to deal with this is just to have people enter their choice in the chat log. In general, we're just trying to see what people are, which of these types of ordinance people think would be most helpful. Um, and so, Anna, do you want to skip this one and go to the next one? Feel, please feel free to put your responses in the chat log, and we'll try to remember that this is pertaining to the to the tree question. Yeah, and if we want to revisit this polling question during discussion, we can certainly come back to totally. it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna dive into our private land ordinance types. So there are, I think, about five that we'll talk about and then um, we'll move into a um, discussion. So starting with stormwater management ordinances, um, these are effectively um, development ordinances requiring that uh, new developments or significant rehabs retain some amount of, of stormwater on site as opposed to sending it into the sewer system. So for instance, in Chicago, we're required, new development is required to capture the first inch of rain, of, of storm, of rainfall on their property, either through an above ground system like a rain garden, bioswale, other bio, bio infiltration system, or they can install sort of a, an underground retention detention basin. Um, this also has a, a fee in lieu option, so people, if developers don't have the space on site to do that, they can pay into a pot of funds that goes to um, funding open space projects in the same area that the development occurred. Um, so this is a really helpful way, especially if you have studied flooding issues in, in your community. It's, it's primarily for the sort of stormwater management piece, um, but as we discussed, green infrastructure has a broader set of benefits. But um, ideally, you would, you would implement some kind of ordinance like this alongside a flooding study to see where there is need for green infrastructure um, and making sure that you're accommodating whatever on-site requirement you have to address that, that particular issue. Um, you, it does require some, some enforcement on the, um, on the city side in terms of design standard, creating a design standard, um, which can be done through per permit review and building inspection. And then making sure that, you know, whatever's installed initially is maintained so that the city continues to get the benefit of that initial installation, which is what Drew sort of already mentioned around the challenges of, of private prop relying on private property owners to be the, the source of your stormwater management or your green infrastructure. Um, you want to make sure you get that benefit over the years. And so there needs to be some kind of enforcement program, uh, whether it's complaint based or whether it's sort of built into the the, uh, the project period, you want to have something like that in place. Um, so again, you shift, you shift the costs here to the private side, but it is driven by development markets. So if you have a community that's experiencing lots of a, a development boom, it might be a really great program to, to put in place. Um, but if you don't, then you might be missing out on, uh, on the actual projects that you, you would want to see that would be driven by development. So for instance, CNT works a lot with communities in the, the Rust Belt and the Great Lakes region, which aren't seeing a lot of development. And so this type of ordinance might not make sense there. Um, and again, the sort of ongoing performance, operations and maintenance um, specifications can be a challenge. So the next ordinance type is similar to a stormwater management ordinance, but it puts more emphasis on uh, the sort of low impact development nature-based solutions as a component of the development as opposed to just setting forth uh, an infiltration requirement or on-site on infiltration requirement. So, um, you know, it's, it's less driven by that, that one inch of rainfall and more about sort of capturing the, the natural hydrology of the site that you're developing on and making sure that you're implementing measures like 
the bioinfiltration practices we've talked about, like trees, like permeable pavement, to, to manage stormwater and get those other community benefits um, during sort of pre, during, and post construction. So low impact development ordinances tend to um, have guide, guidelines, design guidelines, and construction guidelines for that entire period. Um, so you'll need to have a really strong, um, uh, really, really strong design guidelines as well as that sort of permit enforcement piece. Um, and sometimes when you are um, implementing this type of ordinance, you can have a point value system, which might increase density, or um, there are other benefits you can use to incentivize developers to, to take on this type of, of practice. Um, but this, you know, low impact development ordinances are are known and used in some places of, of the country, but they might not be as they might not be as familiar with, um, or some communities might not be as familiar with these types of, of ordinances. Um, and the next two ordinance types are looking at a look at native plants and invasive species um, management. So the native plants ordinance is a pretty um, straightforward ordinance. This is really just focusing on the cultivation of native plants on private property. Um, generally, native plants tend to be a taller growth, so they might look a little bit weedier. You tend to get some nimbyism issues related to native plants. And so this type of ordinance says specifically that native plants, if they're cultivated, if they are um, you know, sort of managed properly, are allowable. Um, and it tends to either refer to an official list of native plants that would be easy to recognize, or you would um, use the language, which is you know, noted here, the sort of actively cultivated, which simply means manage and maintain so that people can tell that it's, it's being taken care of and isn't just sort of laying fallow as a, as a patch of weeds. Um, it does require a lot of local ex expertise if you're relying on the species ID side. So you might get lucky and you have uh, an enforcement officer who's really well versed in native plant ID, in which case, fantastic, you can re rely on that person on the enforcement side. Um, but if you don't have that, it might be really tricky to tell what's native and what's, what might be invasive. Um, and then the other piece here is that native plant, sort of the aesthetic value of native plants can be entirely subjective. And so you might have a few neighbors that really love the look and you might have other neighbors that hate it. And so it can, it can cause a, some, some tension occasionally. CNT has seen that a lot with the communities that we've worked with on sort of educating around what's the appropriate aesthetic, how can we come to sort of a, a, um, a consensus around what we would want to see in our, our private property um, landscaping. And then of course, we get into this issue of this, this sort of encouraging of native plants relies entirely on private interest of planting native plants. Um, and so you, you could perhaps use an educational um, seminar or engage your, your extension office to do more education around the, the matter and talk about the co-benefits, but um, it might not be immediately um, of interest um, absent that sort of educational push. And then invasive plants ordinances, again, this is similar to native planting. We're talking about um, making sure that you have a policy in place that prohibits certain types of plants because of their, um, the possibility of, of damaging your, your native habitat, ecological habitat. Um, this type of ordinance tends to mandate the removal or, or, or containment of an, of an invasive plant species on private property. Um, and again, it tends to be list-based. It, it references an official list of invasive plant species, um, and then you would have to sort of enforce that or figure out a way to make sure that you're, um, you have staff that are knowledgeable enough to go out and say like, you know, this is, invasive, we need to remove it and sort of issue a, um, a, 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 a ticket to do that. Um, the, uh, the challenges with this is that invasive plant species tend not to be, some of them are beautiful. Um, in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes, we have um, a, a really beautiful purple flower that's incredibly invasive in wetlands, but it looks gorgeous. And so it tends to be the case of, you know, many people don't really know what invasives might be. Um, because they look really nice. And so it's the picture on the right here is kudzu, which is an incredibly East Asian invasive vine that's sort of taken over the city of Atlanta. So that's an obvious example of, of an invasive plant. And it's not hard to know when you have that issue creeping into your yard. But 
In other cases, the invasive might be like a rhododendron, and that's a beautiful bush, and it might not on the face of it seem invasive until you look at that list and are reminded of the fact. Um, so again, requires local expertise, um, and it does require, it, it also relies entirely upon public enforcement. So we wanted to do, um, I think, one last poll. We have one more private um, lands ordinance to look at, but this one is, let's see, what type of plant ordinance would be most helpful to your community? Um, see there was the responses coming in. All right, I'm gonna end polling share the results. We've got most folks agree that all of the above might be helpful to the community um, with a specific native plant ordinance referencing a species list as the second most helpful. Um, so again, that's going to rely somewhat on uh, local expertise to enforce that, um, you know, what species are, are um, allowed. All right, so the final private land ordinance type we'll, meant, we'll talk about is cost sharing program, which sometimes operates a little bit differently than an ordinance, but typically the way CNT has seen this done is um, you have, I'm gonna exit out of this. You have a, a community who is interested in supporting their, their homeowners, property owners in investing in natural infrastructure. Um, and so they'll put, uh, they'll, they'll cover some of the costs, they'll share some of the costs of the construction of that feature. Um, so this, this is sort of a, a great incentive to get private property owners who are interested in solving a, a problem on site, whether it's flooding, whether it's they want to improve their habitat, whether it's they, um, you know, just sort of, sort of want to naturalize their garden. This is a good way to incentivize that. Um, there is a, a, a bit of process and procedure involved in making sure that this is administrated properly and CNT is involved in this type of program, we have a rain ready program which operates in partnership with this, the village of Oak Park, a western suburb of Chicago, where CNT supports the administration administration piece um, in terms of sort of finding the the landscaper to do the designs and then making sure that the city is or the village is um, uh, sort of ad administering the the program properly to make sure that we've got the correct or the right eligibility criteria um, and that the, the process happens seamlessly for the homeowner. So there's a little bit of heavy lift there to make sure that the system or the, the program works well. Um, but once it's sort of all set forth, it, it becomes a pretty easy type of program to run. Um, it just needs to be budgeted right up front. Um, so you have the local government, again, verifying the eligibility of the landowner, um, and then you move through the assessment phase where you have someone come on site and identify what might be an appropriate design solution. And then the homeowner takes over with the you know, third party support if that's a part of the program where they would contract with the, the builder, the landscaper doing the work. Um, and then again, the local government reimburses for a share of the construction cost. So you know, again, this can be driven by a landowner motivated to mitigate flooding or other, other issues or solutions they wanna to try to tackle. Um, and it can have significant benefits, especially as the program scales. Um, so you might move from a pilot program where you have 12 homeowners participating up to, you know, 50 homeowners, 75 homeowners a year um, as you get the capacity to, to administer that program. Um, but, you know, back to the sort of the continual challenge here with nature-based solutions is this ongoing maintenance piece, making sure that whatever investment is being made on public or private property has an appropriate set of operations and maintenance guidelines to make sure that the benefit you receive or you're sort of identified to receive is actually realized. Um, and that might require training, it might require some kind of larger workforce development effort, which in and of itself can be a, uh, an economic benefit for the community, but it just needs to be sort of a, 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 a point of consideration early on in the process. All right, so I think we're gonna move into our um, sort of overarching polls, reflecting on all of the ordinances that we talked about to and, go back. To one, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think that we're going to be able to do that tree poll too. Oh, okay. uh, and so I want to just sort of do that real quick before we get to comparing everything together, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll so let I you think jo thanks, Joe. Awesome. 
So there it is. Which type of tree ordinance would be most helpful for your community? Street tree ordinance, tree protection ordinance, view, or, yeah, view ordinance, all of the above. Uh, and I, we did get one person asking, uh, they'd like to be able to select more than one. This is just our way of trying to figure out what might be priorities. Um, and that's why we chose not to do it as a, as a multi-choice. Obviously there's downsides to that. Um, so thanks for, um, just wanted to let you know that's why we chose to do it this way. And maybe if we did this again, we might do it differently. Um, and so now we're sharing the results. It looks like all of the above again um, would, is, is what people are thinking. So that's helpful. Thanks to, to those who participated. Otherwise it looks like maybe tree protection would be in second place. So I'll shut up and let Anna keep talking. Um, no, that's fine. I mean, so the last three polls are, are sort of going back to the, the initial polling questions we asked around um, which of the model ordinances we've discussed would be most helpful to you. So initially we asked whether public or private would be most helpful. And so now we want to hear specifics based on what Drew and I talked about. So this first one is um, which would be most helpful to your, to your community. Um, so we'll give folks uh, another 10 seconds or so to fill this out. And I believe for these next three, we have let people choose more than one. All right, I'm seeing only 40%, so we'll give us another few seconds to finish. Zero percent for the Federal Transportation Project Review. <laughs> Zero percent for cost sharing. All right, I'm gonna end polling and share the results. Um, Although we do have, uh, the majority is all of the above with, uh, let's see, it looks like a stormwater management ordinance would be second place there. Um, so that's really helpful. And, and if there's additional resources that are needed to help sort of build out what that would look like, um, I think that's something that we would really be interested in, in supporting. Um, so the next question is, which of the model ordinance we've discussed provide the greatest community benefit? All right. So you've got your polling questions open. All right, I think we're at over 63, 65%. So I will go ahead and share results. Um, again, all of the above um, with stormwater management ordinance coming in second. So it's good to know that we've got an alignment between benefits and um, community benefits and, and uh, municipal benefits. All right, and the final one is the cost. So which of the model ordinance we've discussed come along with the highest cost to a local government? Thanks everyone for your participation in these. Off to the races, we've got capital improvement planning in first place so far. Um, all right, I'm gonna close polling, share results. Yeah, so folks think that capital improvement planning would come at the highest cost to the local government, which, which, re which resonates with experiences that Drew and I have had in partnership with communities that have done this type of project. Um, but this is helpful. We've got stormwater management ordinance in there as well, which was named as the greatest community benefit and the, the most helpful. Um, so that's a good sort of reaction to what we've been talking about. Um, and now I think we're going to move into discussion. I, I have a few questions here, but I think I'll turn it over to Tom, who's going to facilitate. I know he's been capturing some questions that have come through throughout the presentation. Well, thank you. That was an absolutely terrific presentation. So, um, I'll start There's the first two questions. Well, frame them. The, the biggest challenge I think that we've observed in our metro is the whole question of green infrastructure maintenance. Who does it? How do you pay for it? How do you build the capacity to take care of systems? And so I'd be interested in your general response to that question, but let me share two other specific questions that were asked. Jean from Lewisburg asked, uh, who maintains the drainage ditches? Um, that run between, uh, they've got a project where there's a ditch running between neighboring homes and uh, I want to figure out how can they convert the ditches to something more effective and that look nicer. And the second question is, um, do you, for the cost share program, are contractors certified? Uh, and this was specifically referencing the, the cost share program. 
Do you want to take the maintenance one in or do you want me to take a stab at it? Um, I can take the maintenance one and then reflect a little bit on the, the secondary question there around the drainage ditch because I think we saw that come up in another a project we recently finished. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as Drew and I both mentioned, maintenance is an ongoing concern or issue. And I think the, the bottom line is that, as Drew was mentioning, it, it, green infrastructure needs to be seen as a, a, an asset that's a part of your infrastructure improvement portfolio. And so if a municipality is committed to sort of scaling up investment and distribution of green infrastructure, trees, native plantings, in the public right of way in particular, it needs to be a part of that asset management portfolio. Um, and then just sort of acknowledge the transitional and transactional costs that come along with that shift of shift away from gray infrastructure, which has its own cost and infrastructure investment needs um, into whether it's hiring more people to uh, to maintain the infrastructure or implement new training for folks already on the staff who have been doing infrastructure maintenance. Um, we've seen that uh, that come about in a few cities. I think Detroit is doing a really um, they've done a lot of sort of transitional training and workforce development to support their scaled ap approach for green stormwater infrastructure as a part of their federal consent decree with the EPA to reduce their combined sewer overflow issues. Um, so I think that's, that's just one, one sort of reality is that it needs to be considered as part of that as asset, um, the sort of capital portfolio. Um, and I'll also mention just another um, nod to Detroit on the drainage ditch issue that is between two properties. We've seen several communities on the East Coast, Midwest that have implemented easements where the city has um, sort of an easement based access to the site to maintain and monitor uh, whether it's the drainage ditch that runs between properties or a, a long sort of bio infiltration system at the back of several properties. So the, the city therefore has access that um, to do the operations and maintenance so the burden doesn't fall on the private property owner um, and then that easement tends to say this access we have moves past you know moves across property ownership so even if the property is sold we still have that easement for access of this infrastructure because we see it as a part of our ongoing um, capital improvement program in terms of the uh, thanks, Anna. I would just add too. I think that there's there's sort of there's some interest in a lot of places right now in thinking about how municipal cost sharing measures could be a way to solve the sort of maintenance question that people sort of point to about natural solutions. And so, I think one of the root issues is that we've built all of these um, asset management strategies around. Um, efficiencies of scale and gray infrastructure, right? So we know what our fixed costs are. We know their depreciation rates. We know essentially like when, when you have to buy a new sale plow, um, we know, you know those things are programmed. Those things are known um, and they're predictable. Um, there's no reason they shouldn't be predictable if you're maintaining uh, any kind of natural asset. It's just different. And so what people are sort of talking about is sort of the initial costs that come with different kinds of equipment, different kinds of training, et cetera, et cetera, that come with maintaining natural assets as opposed to the embedded knowledge that's already there for gray infrastructure. And so, you know, I think, I think that it, there's reasons to be concerned and everyone should approach innovation, you know, with trepidation and certainly the public sector especially has good reason to do that. Um, but that's not a reason not to study it. And I think, you know, in Illinois, we we study every single new street to death before, you know, any kind of jackhammer gets out in the street. Um, and there's, you know, if that analog were applied to natural solutions, um, it would be really interesting to see what would happen. And so that's sort of what we're what we're proposing with that overall. Um, yeah. And so in terms of the certification piece with our cost sharing program, uh, we what we do is that in the in the model that Anna described, what we do is have a landscape designer with some um, specialized training in green infrastructure. We pre-qualify or actually we procure assessment services from them in the beginning of the program. And so one landscape designer will actually assess every property based on the amount of, based on the benefit they're trying to provide, which in our case is stormwater. So it'll, it's a measure they design to achieve that performance measure. Uh, and then the homeowner learns okay this is what I have to build in order to meet you know the the needs that I have um, 
as opposed to who they actually work with to do the work. And the reason that we don't certify or even pre-qualify the people that do the work, that build the actual rain gardens, for example, is that in the state of Illinois, we're very much a, a prevailing wage state. And so the cost of doing green infrastructure, if a municipality procures it, is prohibitively high for most people. Whereas if the homeowner can go to any landscaper and say, here's my design, build it, um, and then seek reimbursement for a portion of that cost, then you can get around those um, public procurement restriction requirements. Um, and so the Village of Oak Park's, you know, got a legal opinion on that from their own attorney who, from personal experience, is very risk averse. And so that has stood and that has essentially the, the way that we've encouraged other municipalities to approach it. Okay, there was a, a question on contractor certification. Did you touch that one? Yeah, just now, yep. Okay, very good. So the next question is, when it comes to green infrastructure co-benefits, it seems that your new green values strategy guide has veered away from recommending a way to monetize benefits the way you did in the value of green infrastructure guide and the green values stormwater toolbox. Is there a reason for moving away from the monetization of benefits and or how would you recommend municipalities evaluate co-benefits to compare project alternatives on a cost basis? Yeah, so I can speak to the strategy guide, um, sort of uh, the differentiation between the, the new strategy guide versus the 2020, 2010 value of green infrastructure. Um, what we were trying to do with the, this new strategy guide was create uh, an, an easy to digest set of um, sort of an issue brief around the, the four different um, benefit areas that municipal staff or elected officials could pick up and say, okay, I, I get green infrastructure, I get that there's some sort of quantifiable benefits tied to health, transportation, economic development. Um, help them decide to move forward in a deeper study of what those the valuation impacts would be for that specific place. Um, and then I think we're still relying on a lot of the formula driven work from the value of green infrastructure report from 2010 um, because that that was a lot of um, heavy research and analysis that went into that and we were trying to create a document sort of companion document to say we're seeing some some increased research in this space. We want to pull out what's you know the, the more recent current findings um, and make that available and sort of a digestible handout for municipal staffers and elected officials. And I'll also mention that we are redoing or sort of uh, uh, yeah I guess redoing our our green values calculator, which was done many years ago. Um, we're giving it a facelift and we're we're pulling in some new um, analysis behind on on the back end to make. The, the green values calculator a little bit more robust. And so that will still have the, the valuation component. Um, and that, that tool is not yet live, but that's meant to sort of be as well a companion piece to this strategy guide, which is a little bit more focused on the um, sort of case study research showing the benefits from different places around the country and the world for that matter. Very good. While we wait for additional questions in the chat box, I'll ask one. We are in the middle of a transportation funding round. Um, for the third time now, we have a specific green infrastructure criterion uh, to ensure that project proposals align with the policies embedded in our regional green infrastructure framework. I, um, but we don't require uh, drainage plans submitted at the time of project submission to the MPO. It's, uh, it's kind of further downstream in the project development process. So I'd be very curious to learn more about Gary Indiana's experience and um, or others in terms of successful approaches to incorporating us in, into the transportation projects. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I and I can't remember if it's at the time of project submission or if it's further downstream to that NERPSI does it. And I want to be clear, it's the, it's the MPO for Northwest Indiana. It's not the city of Gary. Just to give credit where credit's due, that's the only reason I'm saying that. Um, but I know that, yeah, I mean, and I, I honestly, they had just adopted that, I believe, that component um, in their review criteria when we interviewed them for the uh, co-benefits calculate or the co-benefits strategy guide project. So I'm not sure that they are clear on the successes yet of that particular component, but 
it would, oh, we'd love to connect Mark with our contact at NERPSI, who I'm sure would, would love to talk about it. She's amazing and thinks that this is great and would, is, it would love to talk your ear off more about it. Oh, it would be my pleasure. Thank you. Of course. Um, the next question, uh, what are the next steps, especially for elected officials? I'm going to take a stab at that, answering it in the context of our project, of this specific project and how we expect for it to move forward. And then maybe Anna and Drew, you could think through or share some experiences from how local communities in Chicago or elsewhere maybe have, have moved through a, a similar process. So for our project, um, Logan and others, we, um, we have engaged with Gould Evans, uh, Center for Neighborhood Technology is supporting the Gould Evans team. Um, Gould Evans will publish a, um, a, a model green infrastructure ordinance that addresses you know, the issues that are discussed here today. And we will share that with everybody for your review and consideration and, and adoption in, in a way that kind of seems right for, for your community. Um, Mark would you know, be thrilled to support that process. I think we're not entirely clear what that might look like. When, when the final product is, is completed, we will share that you know, virtually through a, a, you know, a session like today's, I imagine. And, um, and then we would wanna continue supporting local conversations to facilitate adoption. So it's a, a kind of high level answer, but we're gonna have a report out with some, some ordinance language that you guys can look at and, and think about how or if it applies to, to your community. Um, so Drew or Anna, do you have other specific thoughts about the adoption process on this? Well, and I would definitely want to defer to people locally and, and Gould and Mark on how, what your typical process looks like. Far be it from us to sort of like throw a wrench in what seems to be moving forward and has some inertia here. Um, I would just say, so from my, I used to actually run the model ordinances um, program at CMAP for several years. and. I think we, at first, uh, I think the language helps the communities that are gung-ho for adoption because they're looking for something that has been vetted already and sort of doesn't feel first past the post, which local governments, for good reason, don't like to be generally. Um, but we also found that um, sort of some amount of ongoing technical support for communities that might not have sort of an ease of, of adoption because of political feasibility or because of a variety of reasons um, that, that that technical support can be helpful. And so, you know, certainly that's constrained by the resources that Mark has to provide in that regard and the way that you do your own work planning. Um, and it can come in a variety of forms. So some, some folks are happy enough to have, you know, an independent body come in and, and sort of stand on the line and sort of talk about why this is a good idea and not be staff uh, at, at a board meeting, for example, and that can have its own benefits. Um, other communities really seem to need a lot of support to make sure um, that the language and detail is, you know, locally appropriate, um, sort of fits within existing norms, um, and outreach we've also found to be sort of a concern. So all of these things that we've talked about as sort of being strengths and weaknesses, many of them come down to perceptions. And if you don't know what those perceptions are, or if you're used to sort of only hearing from the people who call City Hall, um, you may have a skewed idea of what those perceptions are. And so using other tools like polling or surveys or even community meetings to sort of bring out other voices and make sure that people understand that there are other voices can also be helpful but those are those are just tools that any planner could name I am by no means a genius by suggesting any of them but those are just some thoughts thank you um, the next question has to do with soils. So in, in broad terms, the, the, the question probably re is reflecting on how soil conservation and restoration practices can be facilitated. And then a, a, a specific question is, one of the co-benefits to green infrastructure could be carbon sequestration. It's entirely dependent on the context, the soil, and what's specified for engineered soils if those are used. Will you include CO2 sequestration in your next iteration? Yeah, I actually think carbon sequestration is in the, the tool that um, our, our analyst at CNT analyst is, is developing. Um, 
I, I'm trying to remember back to why we might not have included that, that in this, this recent strategy guide, and it might have been because it's so context specific, um, but it's a good point, and it's, it's of course, an important uh, benefit to measure and to be talking about. Um, so we'll certainly, with this group, share when the, um, the sort of re, the tool reboot comes live um, and make sure that folks have access to that. I, I imagine we're doing a, a soft launch. I'm not sure if that's going to have some feedback um, opportunities, but um, we'll certainly make sure that folks on this call have access to that. Thank you. Um, other questions from, from all of you? We have another 15 or so minutes available for the call, so you feel free to take advantage of Anna and Drew's uh, experience. I know, Anna, you had posted for a minute a few questions that you wanted to post to the group. Um, I don't yeah. know if you wanted to uh, revisit any of those. Sure. Um, yeah, I somehow got booted off of Zoom. I'm not sure what happened, but I'm back and I'm sharing my screen again. Can you guys see it? It looks like it's, it's visible. Yes. All right, yes. perfect. Yeah, so I guess one of my questions was, depending on the ordinance preference, and it sounds like all of the above with maybe stormwater management um, ordinances being in the lead are helpful. Um, but I'm curious from the group, and maybe this can just be sort of folks putting their ideas into chat, what kind of support you would need from Mark or from some other technical provider would you need to implement the, the measures outlined in the ordinance? From our perspective at Mark, kind of to elaborate on uh, and respond a little bit and elaborate on some of the planning suggestions that Drew had shared, we're game. We're game to help in, in whatever ways you feel might be appropriate um, from assembling resource materials that you could use for your councils, uh, doing presentations at board meetings, convening groups of folks in the community to do different sorts of, uh, to, to discuss these things further. Um, okay, so Joanne says a similar checklist like on the Sustainable Sites Initiative. I'm not familiar with that. Um, Joanne, maybe if you could unmute yourself, you could uh, share what you're thinking. Or Alicia, maybe you could help unmute her. So sustainable sites um, is, was now folded into the USGBC lead rating system and it offers um, a set of, of criteria that are in, included in a point system. And so something like that could perhaps be helpful in, in all of this. It's uh, an effort that try, takes a systems-based approach to facilitating sustainable site design and management. Got it. Jeff comments, implementing native plants and landscaping benefits for homeowners in a community that doesn't currently provide na uh, native landscaping ordinances. I, I mean, I can take that. I think if I'm interpreting it, it's sort of like, how would you encourage it without an ordinance or what's the role? Mm -hmm. um, and I think like one thing that we always try to say is that, you know, especially given the context that we're in now, it doesn't always have to be the municipality that's doing everything. Um, and there's a real role for intermediaries. Um, where we are, there's many different uh, nonprofits that are doing some type of landscaping work or another. There's one that's sort of a, it's more of a, like a badge system where people come in and train you on how to do some kind of a native planting, even up to a, a, a rain garden, um, and then sort of certify that it was done well, and then you get a little yard sign. Uh, and that sort of feeds into sort of the prestige factor. So if you're into this sort of thing and you want a little sign on your yard, it's great. And, and it, it seems to work. Um, so that's sort of one way that that can be done. And, and again, there are nonprofits that do that sort of work pretty much everywhere. Um, there, you know, there's an, another thing to do is sort of um, try to sort of work with a local uh, nursery or 
landscape designer that may have a focus on sort of, you know, a utilitarian landscaping, um, for lack of a better phrase. It's not a huge community and where they are around, they are more than helpful to do presentations, workshops, etc. because for them it's BD and they're more than happy to do it. Um, but there, you know, there's a variety of ways to get, um, to sort of get something going before you're regulating. And then it, you have to sort of make sure that it really is a problem, right? So the issue with native plantings is that the, the perception, the negative perception issue has to be such that there is a, you know, a, a steady rolling of complaints, um, for people against people that are doing native plantings because people don't like the way it looks. Uh, so that presumes that you have a complaint-based code enforcement system. It, it assumes that you have an active code enforcement staff to begin with. Um, and so, you know, it, it may not be a problem other than that there are, you know, a small group of people that are actively opposed to it. Um, and sort of handling that kind of a situation is similar to handling any other um, you know, receipt of a complaint that isn't necessarily enforceable. Um, and we all know that that's difficult. Trust me, I've been there more times than I'm willing, that I would care to relive right now. And I have nothing but empathy for those of you who are going through it. But, um, you know, I think with, with broad support from inside the municipal government, from staff and elected officials who sort of get it, um, you know, there are ways to overcome that. Um, you know, by sort of responding in a consistent way and being clear about what you can enforce and what you can't enforce. Um, and so, you know, the, the native plantings ordinance just codifies it, just says, yep, you can do this. And either it's because you're watering and weeding or because, you know, it's on the list of, of native plants that are, you know, acceptable in your area. Great. All right, we have two more questions that have come in. And if there's time, I might circle back with a native plant uh, ordinance language question. Uh, the next question is, what is the best way to get private land developers on board with these types of ordinances that they perceive to impact their bottom line? Hmm. And I, I guess I'm going to interpret that to mean sort of that the aesthetic negative aesthetic quality of a native planting would therefore sort of reduce surrounding property values. I don't think oh, sorry. No, Tom, intended. I think the intention is that uh, the development community might perceive green infrastructure practices broadly defined to increase their costs. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think to some degree this gets to whether it's the developer or the, the, the maintenance company. Um, so, so the developer typically doesn't have a long-standing interest. They're there to build and to sell. And if the sale comes with sort of an embedded maintenance cost that people aren't used to dealing with, that's problematic, right? And that's sort of the issue in some ways. Um, depending on the kind of development, there'll be a sort of a maintainer, whether it's a um, sort of a leasing company or, a, or you know, sort of a, a manager management company of some kind that's in there in the long run. So sort of one way to deal with that is to seek out a management company or sort of support management companies that are, are you know, that endorse green practices broadly, right? And so there are some management companies that get USGBC, they get all of the ways that it, that it takes to maintain a green building. Um, and many of those companies are going to be familiar with native plantings and things like that. So, you know, identifying those kinds of management companies that are out there saying we are, we're into this stuff and making sure that developers in your community when they come from permit review are aware that they're out there whether that's pointing them to a certain category of, of um, you know certified or, or, or um, registered um, main, uh, land managers in your community um, you know we know that you can't point them to anybody in terms of a procurement barrier a legal barrier but there are ways to sort of like register them as a certain kind of manager that then you can point to a list of or something along those lines um, but those are just some ideas great okay our next question is given the multiple communities on both sides of our state line um, apologies my chat thing moved how do we encourage all the communities to adopt the same ordinance requirements? Thinking about the best management practices manual, not everyone has adopted the current version and some communities have adopted amendments to the document. What's the best way to implement consistency across the metro? Maybe you guys, uh, I can, I, I, maybe you could reflect on how that might have worked in the Chicago region or other regions. 
it's been pretty patchwork quilty as uh, here as well. I mean, I think we have a lot of model ordinances that CMAP has put together and some communities adopt and some don't. And there are a wide range of reasons why that might be. Um, and I think one of the, the helpful things that CMAP has has used, and Drew obviously can speak a lot more about this than I, but this the local technical assist, uh, support, local technical assistance program that CMAP does, which is to say, you know, we have all these resources, we want to help communities implement whatever model ordinance or whatever sort of projects that they that fit within CMAP's priorities. So they invite communities to apply to get support from CMAP to implement something. And so that could be capital planning, it could be master planning, it could be stormwater management. And then CMAP through that LTA process provides resources and support and help and and you know, finds a contractor to come in and do some of the work for those communities. And that helps to increase uptake of some of CMAP's priority ordinances. But I mean, that's one example. And Drew, I don't know if you have. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of obviously, that's what I'm familiar with. Um, I would just say mm -hmm. what we ultimately sort of decided was that um, after we would develop a model ordinance or, and they ended up mostly being called toolkits because there's so much sort of choose your own adventure in any one ordinance. Um, that we ended up sort of teaching, creating a lot of guidebooks that sort of helped them through the, you know, what factors to consider when making an ordinance. And then, you know, what is different language you could use if you given those factors? And then how would you roll that out in implementation? Um, that we sort of found that uh, a way to incent people to adopt ordinances that adhered to the values of the regional was to sort of say, those who want to adhere to the values of the regional vis-a-vis -vis the regional plan, those will be the people who receive, those will be the entities that receive technical assistance. Um, and so that was sort of how we did that. Um, and it's a way, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and say that it is bulletproof or even necessarily uh, making, you know, huge, you know, adoption strides year over year. It's an incremental approach and that's what government does, honestly. And so in that way, you know, I think I would say that municipalities that saw other municipalities getting that free help, essentially, because that's what we were providing, um, and began to see that many of their residents who they had concerns uh, about going in a certain direction would get through these processes and you know everything was okay uh and that you know no upheaval happened as a result or during the process um not to say there were never points of tension for sure but um would, would then begin to say okay maybe i you know maybe i didn't align myself with the regional plan before but now that i've seen this other community that i find myself more like go through it i'm much more interested in going through the same process and so you know, we started with the usual suspects that we knew were going to want to play ball. And then over time, it's completely unusual suspects that now are like, okay, maybe we could work with CMAP. Um, and that, that I think is having an impact. You know, it's a long range plan. So the implementation is going to be long range. You sort of have to make peace with that. That's my experience alone. I don't want to put words in Mark's mouth at all. Yeah. Well, One thing that I might mention really quickly our, our local sewerage district, which serves a, 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 a different territory than CMAP, and it's its own taxing body, so it's sort of a separate entity unto itself, and it manages our, our sort of wastewater, stormwater um, in this area. They, they have a consent decree, right, to in, increase the amount of green infrastructure that's used for stormwater management specifically. And green infrastructure is also a priority of CMAP, sort of scaling up GI. Um, and MWRD has our, our local our regional sewerage district has a green infrastructure grant program, which cities and, and villages and towns can apply to if they have shovel ready projects for those dollars. And so even though the funds for green infrastructure are coming from a separate body, it's in line with the, the MPO, the regional MPO. And so that's, a, that's one way to sort of think about the regional approach is to find other partnerships that could help with the, the finance and funding of green infrastructure in a more distributed way across the, the broader network. And I like your thoughts and I, I don't really think we have a lot to add from our community. We've worked at uh, model ordinances or advancing particular policy issues and we find variability around our region for as you said in lots of different reasons and so uh, I'm hopeful that the, that the language that Gould Evans 
uh, generates will provide a starting point and some consistency regionally. And, um, and then the regional outreach that we do um, following you know, your, all lead, your all's lead might help support that in some way as well. Let's see, two other uh, comments. Um, let's see, the first one had to do with, um, let's see, dandelions are not native plants and many people already view native plants as weedy. It has to be meticulously navigated in order to have a native, a successful native plant ordinance. Uh, plants such as considered with weeds like dandelion or lamb's quarter are valuable food and medicinal plants, so ordinances should include these as well as encouraging native vegetation. Um, those are just comments. I'm not sure if you'd like to respond or not. I mean, I agree, <laughs> but I think yeah. it's the, the how that gets implemented, right? I okay. Think uh, one, the last question that's posted here is one that I frankly love. Uh, how could green infrastructure help with food security or hunger or nutrition in the community? And um, I might just comment that I think we have a lot of spaces where agroforestry, food forests, um, alternative plant palettes that include different edible kinds of plants could easily be incorporated into to, uh, planting schemes that in ways that meet water management goals uh, and uh, issues of food security at the same time. So I just absolutely love that question. There's a lot there. That's my response, but Anna and Drew. Yeah, we actually, I, it's a, I agree, it's a great question and, and one that I think can be thought of in, in both the sort of incorporating native plants in the, the sort of edible palette that you're planting as a part of an urban agricultural endeavor. Um, and also thinking about the sort of more traditional like bioswale, rain garden, bioinfiltration projects as a, a very complementary installation alongside a, a traditional urban ag plot, right, in terms of the the stormwater management you might get from runoff from the urban ag area or the additional pollinators that come in. So they're very complementary um, practices and can be integrated fully through the edible space or can be sort of side by side from the co-beneficiary. And Anna's being demure, but she's actually worked on projects like that and had a lot to do with seeing uh, uh, green infrastructure go alongside and complement um, urban ag. We also have supported another project loosely in the city of Chicago where a uh, um, west side community is developing an eco orchard. So it's using, uh, you know, fruit bearing trees as a means to manage stormwater as well. So there is, there are complementary. They're not at cross purposes at all. Mm -hmm. I might add that we've initiated conversations with the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry and I believe that there could be some really interesting riparian restoration projects that use plants like pawpaw, pecan, hazelnut, different berries, persimmon, wild plum, right? So you can, you can generate an edible forest canopy while at the same time we're restoring these riparian corridors that we know are so essential for resilience and uh, habitat quality and water quality protection and flood risk reduction and so forth. So- um, Tom's a forager, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's good. It's, it's, it's a great topic. I love it. All right. So it is 1129. So at this point, um, I want to thank Anna and Drew for your fabulous presentations. Um, I, I, you bring just so much knowledge and experience to this, and we're, we're lucky to have you help us out with this project. As we indicated previously in our conversation, uh, Gould Evans will draw from CNT's experience in today's presentation, along with the results of two focus groups, the second of which uh, is, will be scheduled for the near future, and then use that to finalize uh, language for a, a model ordinance that we will then, uh, have, once it's completed, share with, with all of you and others who may be interested. In the interim, feel free to reach out to me. My uh, email is on the screen. Um, my phone number is 816-701-8352. So you're, you're welcome to reach out and I'll help however I can. Um, CNT's contact information is, is available online. And so let me again thank all of you for taking the time to join us the, the, uh, this morning on this. And um, I look forward to working with everybody to try and see how far we can get in terms of more green infrastructure, tree native landscaping, invasive species, and other sorts of ordinances that help us uh, uh, achieve our shared goals. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody.